Pornhub averages 115 million visits per day, 42 billion visits per year, and generates millions upon millions of dollars in revenue. It's the global epicenter of internet pornography. And yet, the most powerful porn site in the world just shut down operations in four states. Why? A law requiring user identification to protect children was passed by a freshman senator in Louisiana. Find out how an unlikely partnership between a Republican and a radical feminist crashed Pornhub in four states, with 18 more about to follow suit. Also, Neo, the singer behind many middle school bops, was in the center of controversy for his take on trans ideology. His response to the backlash was surprising. And finally, the US women's national team gets humbled at the World Cup, which might not be such a bad thing. All this and more on this week's edition of The Loopcast. God bless everyone. Welcome back to the Loopcast, where we talk faith, culture, and politics. Josh, have a great vacation, but we brought in a replacement. Today, we have Catholic Vote President Brian Birch. Brian, how are you doing today? I'm good. I guess I'm the designated hitter. A little more hair, but I hope to be just <laughs> as interesting. So you and, you and Josh have uh, an interesting relationship, and I think it's almost necessary to provide some context here. How long have you known Josh, and where does the relationship start? So I first met Josh in the early 2000s. Him and I were both working for Tom Monahan and his uh, uh, Ave Maria Foundation. Uh, he had sold Domino's Pizza, and I was helping uh, operate a nonprofit called the Thomas More Law Center. And he was running the Ave Maria list, which was Tom Monahan's political efforts. And uh, ultimately, Tom decided to go to Florida and build a university and a town called Ave Maria, Florida, we which know Tom is familiar there. with. Yeah. Yes, very familiar. And uh, the rest of us decided that we wanted to do something differently, um, all all good, all friendly. And we ultimately founded uh, what became Catholic Boat in 2005. And, um, so Josh and I have been at this for a bit. Yeah. So it's it's almost like having the, uh, the other side of the brain, the other side of the corn, if you will, uh, on the podcast today. Of course, we have Erica, everyone's favorite co-host. <laughs> Stop it, Tom. Principal libertarians have been put on notice. So we have a case. It was a, it was an interesting article written by Politico, and it was specifically about how uh, Pornhub has ceased to do business in four states. And it's not by choice. It's because of an ID law that was introduced, basically requiring people to provide a government-sponsored ID, proving that they're over 18 years old. Something that was required, quote unquote, but without any real enforcement. But now that there's some teeth in it in places like Louisiana, Pornhub has just decided it's not worth doing business there, which is one of the first big blows, I think, to the adult uh, adult entertainment industry that I've really seen in my lifetime. It's really kind of unbelievable. So the story behind it's really interesting. I think there's a lot to dig into here. Erica, could you go into the background, specifically in Louisiana, how this thing came about? Sure, Tom. So in 2022, Louisiana passed a bill requiring porn sites like Pornhub, like you said, to require users to show their government ID to prove that they're 18 or older. So Louisiana was the case study for Pornhub's, or sorry, not for Pornhub, for Politico's story here. And this is happening in states all over the country. Uh, nearly identical bills have passed in six other states, including Arkansas, Montana, Mississippi, Utah, Virginia, and Texas. In the current legislative session, though, another 16 states have identical bills up for vote. So this is a movement that's sweeping the nation pretty rapidly. The interesting thing about the Louisiana story, though, is that the bill was introduced by a freshman representative named Lori Schlegel, and it sailed through. Lori Schlegel is a rather polarizing figure, even in a red state like Louisiana. But her bill sailed through the Louisiana House at a vote of 96 to 1, and the state Senate unanimously 34 to nothing. And the one House representative who voted against the bill was, of course, a uh, pro-trans kid surgery, very vocal, blue-haired activist. So no surprises yep. there. She stood her ground. <laughs> she has values. Um, really standing up for the big guy. Also. Right. So Go in ahead. an era where the country is massively <laughs> divided, these kinds of bills are garnering overwhelming bipartisan support. Schlegel teamed up. This was really interesting to me, and you put me onto this, Tom. Schlegel teamed up with uh, a, a feminist named Gail Dines. She's a Brit. Feminist, uh, feminist I mean, doesn't do feminist enough justice. Feminist is actually I mean, kind of a mild way of putting who Gail yeah. Dines is. She is radical Marxist, anti-capitalist. She's an expat from the UK, and uh, but she has become an anti-porn activist 
uh, based on her own experience um, doing research on the effects of porn on young men. She has a son. She talks about there's a really interesting 2015 TEDx talk, which I'm going to warn you is R-rated. Uh, but she, Gail goes into um, just the devastating effects of young men growing up from the ages of 12 and up uh, in a pornified culture, as she calls it. But Gail Dines teams up with Lori Schlegel and they take Louisiana by storm with this bill. Over a year later, we're starting to see the data. Louisiana visits to the Pornhub site before uh, were 80% higher. So it's 80% loss of business in Louisiana. Um, and as you mentioned, in three states with identical or similar legislation, Utah, Mississippi, Virginia, Pornhub simply stopped Pornhub simply stopped operating altogether. They just pulled out. So now when residents of Utah, Mississippi, or Virginia go to try to access Pornhub, they are greeted by a fully clothed and very popular porn star who explains to them the importance of free speech and artistry and the rights of the adult <laughs> entertainment industry to to apply their trade without any sorts of restrictions like what we're seeing here. So that's the story of big success when a simple piece of legislation is actually making a real difference in American lives with huge bipartisan support. Yeah, so I mean, this is a super interesting because this issue of all issues, and, and by the way, for those that are listening, sometimes even this kind of conversation is not necessarily for all audiences. So just as a fair warning, probably should issue that quick warning. Uh, even the conversation around porn can sometimes be uh, unhealthy for a lot of people, uh, even to be talking and thinking about it. Uh, but, you know, I, I think back when we started Catholic Vote and we had this big roaring success initially, and I remember we reached the top 100 of all websites in the world. And I, for the first time, I actually started looking at the rankings of websites. And this was the first time I actually realized how massive these websites are. I mean, we're talking hundreds of millions of visits every day. They are the most trafficked websites on the internet today. And so to try to slow this is, it seems like this David and Goliath impossible kind of uh, challenge. And, and frankly, our side, Republicans have been on the sidelines for decades. And now you're starting to see um, you know, this amazing kind of progress where you're starting really like dramatic drop-offs in traffic. And a lot of it is as a result of the tools that the internet now enables. And we can go through a little of the history of like how pornography regulation has worked. You know, there was this Communications Decency Act passed in the mid 90s, signed by President Clinton, which, by the way, so less people think it's impossible to do this, banned the distribution of all indecent pornography images to children under 18. I mean, this is a law passed in the mid 90s, signed by a Democrat, um, was ultimately overturned by the courts because, uh, you know, wait for it, undue burden on the free speech rights of adults. It's funny to look back some of the language of the decision. They essentially said the Internet is not as pervasive as radio and print. And therefore, <laughs> uh, we, we can't police it in the way that we would allow, for example, because we do allow you know, pornography to police in radio and print. Well, of course, that sounds crazy now. Uh, but this was struck down in part because there was no feasible way to zone out um, pornographic websites on the Internet at the time. And so now you have these age verification tools and a bunch of software that that is um, available. Uh, and uh, these states are saying, look, there actually is a way to do this now to not burden adults. Um, I hate to even use that term as if this is some kind of burden, uh, but then to truly protect kids. And, you know, the other thing, if, sorry, I know I'm Go for it. filibustering here. Walk, walk them on. <laughs> this shows the power of something that, that we forget as a culture, the power of social shame. Really what's happening here is in order to access this website, you have to prove you're an adult, according to some of these laws. So you have to, what, submit some sort of verification online. Yeah. Well, a lot of these people uh, using these terrible websites, they're ashamed of what they're doing. And they certainly don't want to be, you know, giving some website a copy of their driver's license uh, for who knows what purposes down the road. Uh, and so it's, it, it, I think it's a, it's a, fantastic example of states being innovative, using the new tools available and doing something meaningful to protect kids. Yeah. So Brian, you mentioned uh, 
not trusting certain organizations with uh, government ID. And uh, I think it's fair to say that it, we so we can't even trust organizations. So MindGeek is the uh, owner of Pornhub. And Pornhub has been, uh, so Visa, I believe, and another credit card has decided they can't do business MasterCard, on Pornhub. Yeah. MasterCard, because uh, they basically have so many examples of child pornography, uh, revenge porn, like some of the worst of the worst of the worst, be people being sex trafficked and, and having that video be put online. And Pornhub is completely aware that this is on here and can't, they say they can't do anything to take it off, but basically it just gets republished and republished and republished. So I think it's uh, it, it's smart in a few ways because you shouldn't trust these people. So even people that are going on the site really should not trust this organization. I mean, they've settled with so many different groups of people over the type of things that have been found on the website. But, but the four A's of the porn industry, if you will, this is something that came up in this TED Talk I thought was really interesting. Accessible, affordable, anonymous, and aggressive. So if we take away one of the A's here with anonymous and one of the A's for children with accessible, it, like it doesn't surprise me that uh, traffic has dropped to 80% or down, have dropped 80%. So it's now at about 20% of what it was. And uh, I've just, it, it, I think it's, so I, I watched this interesting podcast. It's called um, Consider Before Consuming. It's actually by an organization called Fight the New Drug. And they had a girl on who, was sex trafficked. I mean, once again, you know, disclaimer, we're going to have to put a disclaimer on this episode. This is really heavy, but basically she was uh, uh, misled and coerced into doing things on camera. And uh, this this was from a very well-known, actually port partner with Pornhub. It's called, uh, you can look up the lawsuit. It's called Girls Do Porn. The wiki is unbelievable. The things that they did to uh, girls all over the country in our own backyard, it kind of reminds me of Sound of Freedom a little bit. Um, but when you're going on a site like that, you're you're contributing to this type of thing, whether or not you know it. Like you're going to a place that enables this, and they this uh, this girl and a couple other girls they sued these people. One's on the FBI watch list. They just caught him in Spain about a year ago. But then uh, Pornhub settled with them because they were taking what they knew to be sex trafficked material, putting it on Pornhub, and making money off of views that came to that, knowing that this is what happened. This was already after all of the FBI case. The Department of Justice case came out. So like the most evil of evil, but as, as someone that grew up in the internet age, I think this is kind of an interesting thing to think about too. Like I've, uh, of course, encountered pornography. You know, I'm a young man. I grew up, I think I, the first time I came across it was 12. It's, it's one of the, brings about some of the most shame of anything that I've encountered in my life. And we have really, we're finally starting to see some studies and effects on uh, people who, young men and women, it's not just a men problem, who grew up encountered pornography at a young, young age and have, have been in this pornified culture now for like 10 plus years. And they can't find people who haven't encountered internet pornography to do a test study on. They can't find a base group. So the fact that it's so pervasive, um, I think that it really contributes to, and the political article did a good job of pointing this out. Like we, we're, we're more anxious, we're more depressed. People are reporting they're not as happy. And I think, you know, rampant widespread use of like, the most accessible, aggressive, graphic pornography to children, young minds, and then keeping them inundated that throughout their lives, I think definitely contributes to a lot of the problems we're seeing in society right now. So I could see this as a huge win societally just to protect, you know, some of our young children. I think people are growing up in my seat now understand the stakes because they've lived through it. Yeah. And I know? think it's really important for people of my generation, Brian's generation, because um, we talk about, you know, our first exposure, if we were ever so exposed to pornography, as being like finding dad's magazines under the bed or blah, blah, blah. And it's so different now. I think that uh, the TED Talk that I mentioned does a really good job of pointing out that when we talk about the pornified culture that like younger millennials, Gen Z are growing up with um, now, we're talking about exposure to the most vile, aggressive it, like it, it's so disgusting. It's not even. It's not just people having natural intercourse. It's all kinds of violence, and it's image too. It's moving images, and um, what Gail Dink points out in her talk are, of course, you, you know, the massive numbers we we probably all know. But like seventy three percent of teens um, between the ages of thirteen and seventeen have already watched pornography like this, like the aggressive, gross stuff online. And the effects later on, the sort of mixture of 
uh, a message that this is this is what makes you a man now, or this is what makes you an adult now that you've watched this, or that you make this a habitual part of your life, coupled with this deep sense of shame that a young child experiences when they encounter evil and they know that it's wrong. Um, it, it divides not only young people from their future spouses, but it divides them from their parents' generation. It divides them from people um, who haven't encountered that and and really isolates them, resulting in this sort of anxiety and this depression. Um, and I mean, I just want to point out some of the amazing ministries, apostolates, whatever you want to call them, are out there that are helping people right now. And uh, Magdala Ministries by our good friend Rachel Kalaki, also an Ave graduate, that really uh, looks at women and girls who have been exposed specifically to this. for women, but specifically for Which women, is very overlooked. Right, that it's been taboo for a long time to say, oh, women have this issue too. Not in the numbers that we're seeing with men, obviously, but uh, it's still a real issue. And she's reaching out to them. I'll drop her website in the show notes. Um, we've also got, uh, for men, we've got Sex Addict Anonymous, which is like a 12-step program uh, for men and women, but primarily men. Um, and that's been tremendous help to you know friends and their kids uh, with me. So I just wanted to drop those you know signs of hope there is work being done here in addition to the legal wins that we're seeing in states yeah. like Louisiana. I, I think it's worth noting here too, Tom, you open up the segment referring to it as, you know, principled libertarians are worried about what's going on here. And of course, that you know, line is kind of, you know, uh, pregnant with a lot of meaning because we're living in an era on the right among conservatives where there's actually a different conversation going on than where we had, say, in the 1990s. And part of this is the question of, is there actually a role for the federal government? Certainly in this case, we're talking about state's government, state governments putting in this age verification requirement. But there is a question, is there a role for the federal government to police uh, what's happening, um, uh, obviously, online, particularly when it comes to children? And the answer to that question is obviously yes. No question. It, I mean, pornography is outlawed, banned, not allowed in all, 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 most of Southeast Asia. I mean, this is, it, it, there's different types of restrictions in different parts of the world, Eastern Europe, of course. Once again, America is the Wild West, the free for all. We can't restrict anybody's so called freedom. And, it, and not to get too you know, political, philosophical here, but the idea of liberty is not the freedom to do whatever you want, um, you know, this radical individualism. We're talking about the freedom to pursue the good. That is what we as Catholics believe, this authentic idea of freedom. And it's worth noting here, as you suggest, in a lot of these states, these were passed by overwhelming bipartisan majorities, in some cases, unanimously. Um, and so maybe a trick question you can ask people, what is the most bipartisan issue in America right now? It may actually be this. <laughs> right. you know, where does a radical pro-abortion feminist and, you know, Catholic vote actually agree. It's that, you know what, we the state needs to do something here. And, you know, for all the free speech, uh, federalism, principle of subsidiarity, I'm sorry, but the lower levels of society are have demonstrated an incapacity to overcome this beast. And we do need higher levels of civil society to intervene here. Now, there are lots of different ways we can do this in the free market with filters and such, but it is high time. And it's high time, frankly, we need to be demanding presidential candidates even, if you get into office, what is your plan? What kind of legislation will you back? And what will you task your attorney general with doing? This is a responsibility of the Department of Justice. And if we have a strong pro-family, anti-obscenity Department of Justice, uh, we should be prosecuting these websites and putting them out of business. I mean, it's possible. It's, it's really interesting to see two things going on culturally. One, this bipartisan effort to like the I guess the effects of pornography have been so proven at this point that both Democrats, Republicans, radical, not radical, everyone wants some type of accountability to keep it like out of the hands of children. And that's not to say that people can't do VPNs or whatever, but that also doesn't mean we should make it completely accessible and easy for, you know, 11 year olds to see this stuff. But then we also kind of have uh, an odd group of society where, you know, we see drag shows in public for kids and we see. Uh, very public obscenity, pride parades, uh, libraries having pornographic material, and that seems to be a hot button issue. So I guess my question here is, what what is so unifying about the porn for children 
talk that we're having right now, but why are we not seeing a broad spread, you know, uh, push for accountability against obscenity in general? It's a great question. I mean, I, I can speculate. Obviously, one of it is that there's a broad addiction culturally that doesn't want to address it because people don't want to get rid of it. I think the other thing is, is the lobby obviously is exceptionally strong. And then you have, of course, weak Republicans and, and some principled libertarians, as you suggest, that worry that if we allow the government to step in and start policing what we can say online, um, then we're going to uh, so-called head down the slippery slope where the government is going to now start banning all sorts of speech, which of course is nonsense. I mean, look at, we're banning so-called disinformation. We're using the FBI <laughs> and the federal government to ban so-called disinformation on Twitter, but we can't ban, you know, uh, 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 pornographic, uh, content that's exploiting trafficked children, uh, for minors. This is out. It's just the double standard is outrageous. It's possible. And, and we need to be more forceful here. The other piece of this that I think is important is the secret behind kind of a lot of the culture issues that no one wants to talk about is this issue is upstream of all of them. You know, why do women feel the need to have the right to kill their unborn children? Why? Because they want to have unprotected, reckless sexual encounters with uh, outside of marriage is part of it, right? And they feel vulnerable because if they do so, they might get pregnant. Well, why are men treating women this way? Why are men looking to go to bars or however they go to um, take advantage of women? Well, we know why that is. It's because they spend hours every day being induced to do these kinds of things. Also, by the way, mass shootings, always a pattern. What is it? Um, you know, mental, il mental illness, drug use, and heavy, heavy pornography use. No one ever talks about these mass shootings. Always the, uh, the 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 criminal behind it usually is very steeped in, in a lot of this pornography, and they're never held accountable for that, which is shameful. Yeah, it's a really interesting. Sch Schlegel made that point too when she, when she talks about men uh, like a rape culture. She's like, it's it, this isn't uh, you know a bug in the future. They're being conditioned to do this. They're actually too conformist was the word that she used, which I thought that really gave me pause and made me think a lot. I was like. To your point, if you're sitting in hours and hours and hours of this filth of like seeing people as objects, not seeing people having dignity, of course, uh, it would kind of change the way you would condition you to think a certain way about the dignity of life. I think that's like the, the end point here is, I guess, if we could utilize the common good here within the government to uphold the dignity of human life, like this just seems like a dignity issue to me at the end of the day. We should as a society. We have, if we it have the is, ability to. It, it, and, and, you know, it, this is kind of, you know, Catholic vote insider stuff. So it's kind of fun. Something we talked about for a long time as a project um, is to retain um, high level um, uh, uh, product liability attorneys to go after the, the porn industry. I mean, we now have um, health insurance programs covering sex addiction therapy. So this is a this is a uh, mental illness. It is a condition that now they medical community is recognizing as a true pandemic of sorts um, that people are suffering from. I mean, they, but but the purveyors of this content are purposely using the addictive nature of their of their product in order to lure people in and then to manipulate and, and to keep them addicted. And yet they're never held responsible. Trans fat companies, smoking companies, everyone else is getting sued saying, you know your your product is bad. <laughs> you know it. You you know it. It lures people in. You know it's addictive, and you're purposely using the tricks of your industry in order to lure people in and, and to um, get them addicted to your product. And, and yet somehow uh, they escape all liability. Well, again, there's a bipartisan way here. You may not like trial attorneys, but I'm if you're a seasoned trial attorney looking to create a massive class action. We would like to talk. Yeah, I mean, I, I enjoyed Suits. I thought Suits was fun, other than Meghan Markle was a little <laughs> bit annoying. But uh, yeah, I have no problem with trial attorneys. So we move on now. Uh, the news just came in. Uh, Ohio, unfortunately, uh, we lose on uh, Proposition 1. And uh, I would like, it's nice having the guy who, you know, probably knows the most, was involved the most. We have Brian on today. Uh, Brian, any words of, of wisdom after, you know, what seems to be kind of a tough loss? Yeah, number one, we need to get away from this loss as quickly as possible because this was not technically about abortion. It was about changing the rules of amending the Ohio Constitution. 
And the last thing we need right now is people to get real discouraged. We did lose pretty big, but one of the reasons we lost pretty big was that a lot of Republicans voted against this, not necessarily because they're pro-abortion, but because they didn't like the idea of changing the rules to amend the state constitution. The democracy needs to work, don't attack democracy message kind of work. The other piece, and this is going to be the struggle, of course, going into later this year in Ohio and then into next year in many different states, uh, is that the abortion issue is massively motivating the left. Uh, this, If you look at the, the turnout numbers in Ohio, I think I looked at them this morning, in this August special election, there was essentially a ballot initiative. Over 3 million Ohioans voted. That's it's just stunning. massive. Yeah, it's it, stunning. It, and, and of course... Um, the left outspent us double. I mean, there's heavy blame to go, by the way, to a lot of the business community in Ohio that totally sat on the sidelines on this. Um, a lot of the Republican establishment that, that said, well, it's this is going to be abortion and we don't want to touch it. Meanwhile, the Democratic Party fully organized, fully deployed, uh, totally orga uh, organized the turnout operation. Our side's left to pro-life groups you know, Catholic Vote, Susan B. Anthony List, a couple other groups that were forced to carry all the load here. And you can't win elections when you're essentially your allies are, you know, sitting on the sidelines. And um, it's going to be hard. We're going to go into November and they're going to try to get this, you know, radical abortion uh, amendment um, in, you know, uh, in Ohio, done in Ohio. Um, but I'm not totally pessimistic. I still think we can win. I think the conversation that we started in Ohio um, can be built upon because a lot of people are awakening to the fact that you know, this is not just a question about abortion. It's a question about parental rights. It's a question about children being able to transition without their parents knowing. And there's a lot of Republicans that I think didn't want to necessarily change how Ohio's constitution can be amended, but are still on our side when it comes uh, to protecting children, protecting parental rights, et cetera. So, um, stay tuned and don't get discouraged. Um, you gave me an answer to this potentially, but I want to hear a little bit more context. So this is something that, uh, if you're kind of spending a lot of time in, uh, media specifically on the right, there seems to be this split about people deciding whether or not abortion is a good issue for conservatives or Republicans. You know, even people as high as Trump have said, well, the problem is pro-lifers, like that they want to be too aggressive on abortion. It's not a winning issue. The left is going to kill us. And then there's other people who are saying, no, abortion is actually like a gateway to a lot of the other things that you're talking about here. Do you think the fact that, you know, we got this out of out of the system in August, you know, we had this election, we put it on people's consciousness. Are people going to be able to build a coalition around, you know, a baseline abortion protection for on a state level and Ohio and then the rest of the country? Like, how do we reconcile the differences in the coalition right now on whether or not abortion is a, a toxic or winning issue? Well, there's going to be a, some portion of the right that are going to say, and there are, of course, a number of them in Washington, D.C. that say, look, it's a state's issue. We're going to stay out of it. And then at the state level, just say, look, uh, this is a losing issue. post Dobbs, it's motivating our opponents and we need to set it aside. Let's just declare once and for all, uh, politics for the sake of politics is a waste of time. The reason you do politics is to actually change and, and uh, bring about the good. So we are never going to set the abortion issue aside, quote, in order to win. But we do have to be wise as serpent, innocent as doves. It doesn't mean every last bill, every last uh, pro-life initiative is a good idea. We do need to be smart which ones we which ones we advance and then when we are doing so, how we message it and how we how we get behind it. I have absolute confidence in all of these states where the pro-abortion movement is on the march. If we are united, and especially, by the way, if the church is united, I will tell you without giving too many details, the church was divided in Ohio. The position of the Catholic Conference in Ohio was this is a, uh, they have no position on issue one. They said the content of the of the ballot initiative was morally neutral, and therefore they had no position. Uh, we had some bishops that we were able to work closely with that were extremely helpful. They were putting notices in their bulletins. They were preaching from the pulpits. We had other bishops, by the way, discouraging their priests from working with us on this. And so it's absolutely shameful. And we got to get away from this. The church needs to be united. And certainly there will be zero excuse for not doing everything possible. And, and you know, we need to hold them accountable, too. Absolutely. 
in November yeah. I'm talking about, right? Yeah, right. When we comes up in November. And so stay tuned. We're we're going to be very involved there, I think. And Brian, maybe we'll have to have you back on then. But I appreciate the analysis there. So, so reactions, like I've said, are hot in the streets. It's unbelievable. I see them everywhere. And, I, you know, I don't want to just bring on, you know, someone on TikTok saying something insane. But I, I saw something this week that really piqued my interest. And it's cool having Brian here. We'll have a little, like, fresh reaction. But I kept from you what this is. I have it right now. Neo, if you've ever, if you grew up in my era, he, he ran the hip hop world. Neo was everywhere. He was in every middle school dance I was a part of. Here we go. I, I feel like parents have almost almost forgotten what the role of a parent is. Amen. It's like, okay, Lost control. if your little boy comes to you and says, daddy, I want to be a girl. And you just let him rock with that. You just let. Right. He's five. Right. And where did he get that if from? If you let this five-year-old boy decide to eat candy all day, he's going to do that. Exactly. Like, when, when did it become a good idea to let a five-year-old, let a six-year-old, let a 12-year-old make a life-changing decision for themselves? Right. When did that happen? Right. Like, I don't, I don't understand that. Initial thoughts. Was this a ridiculous statement? Go, Neo. I mean, I'm actually <laughs> on board with Neo on this one. <laughs> Big Neo fan? The loss of par- parents stepping in, the whole, like, you know, we're going to accept all diets and body things and whatever the kid wants to do. I mean, this is classic Matt Walsh fodder, right? I feel like we're, we're running a Matt Walsh vibe here, Tom. This uh, seems pretty reasonable. Yeah, this I'm is re- a story I'm, in parts, of course. I'm down, so Neo. something happened. So, so, okay, after this happened, do you have any guesses what, uh, what happened after this? So I, I'm going to hint there's some controversy. How do you think Neo responded to this? I want Brian's take. Predictions, bold predictions, Brian. Well, sorry, this is going to prove that I'm a total, you know, cultural <laughs> ignoramus, but I even know who Neo is. So, Tom, I'm, you know, happy that he entertained you at your high school dances. But he did, yeah, uh, it was sick. You, you actually set this up, by the way. You said, I'm going to play a video in the podcast, and you guys, I want you to watch it for the first time. So, we had no idea what you were going right. to show us here. The yep. first thing that came to mind is that, is I think, a famous quote, I think it was William F. Buckley that was asked to define conservatism. And he said, it's a liberal mug by reality. <laughs> and in a lot of ways, that, that that seems to be exactly what's going on here, right? And we're like, yeah, of course, right? This is just like some sort of like, you know, deep philosophical reflection that uh, you shouldn't be, you know, counseling a five-year-old to, you know, change their gender. And, and it's a great line, though. It's a great analogy. You, there's a lot of things you don't let a five-year-old do. You don't let them eat too much candy. So why would you, you know, in, even entertain this? But it's refreshing, by the way, to see, uh, you know, some sort of pop cultural icon, assuming that's what he is, actually so, get mugged by reality. So, yeah, my prediction, what happened? My guess is, you know, he got canceled, Twitter shamed. How dare he? Crucified. Uh, he is, you know, anti-LGBT, homophobic. Am I right? So we get a an apology I'd like to express my deepest apologies. After much reflection, I'd like to express my deepest apologies to anyone that I may have hurt with my comments on parenting and gender identity. I've always been an advocate for love and inclusivity in the LGBTQI plus community, so I understand how my comments could have been interpreted as insensitive or offensive. Gender identity is nuanced, and I can honestly admit I plan to better educate myself on the topic so I can approach future conversations with more empathy. At the end of the day, I lead with love and support everyone's freedom of expression and pursuit of happiness. Oh, come so, on. I mean, it's, it's like the, 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 the standard like chat GPT and, and uh, apology, <laughs> like type in, I need to, doesn't, don't they all start sounding this? They all start sounding the same. I need to better educate myself. I'm deeply apologetic, the inclusivity stuff. It's just, here's the funny thing is we all know he doesn't believe that. Brian, right. you have great instincts. I have another video to show you. This is a story in parts. Here we go. Do what you want to do with your kids. However, Somebody asked my opinion on this matter, and this is how I feel. I will never be okay with allowing a child to make a decision that detrimental to their life. I will never be okay with that. I don't. I, I definitely plan to educate myself a little bit more on this matter. However, I doubt that there's any book anywhere or any opinion that somebody's going to tell me that's going to make me okay with letting a child make a decision like that. That's just period, point blank, and that's how I feel. If I get canceled for this, then you know what? Maybe this is a world where they don't need a Neo no more, all right? So wait, that was after the apology. This was after the apology, and he started. I had to play a clip of it, but he started out with, "I want you to hear this from the horse's mouth, not the publicist's desk." Mm, So it turns out the publicist posted that, 
And he did not want that posted at all. So he goes back to his personal Twitter to be like, yeah, uh, that's ridiculous. I mean, it kind of is annoying to me that he can't just go, you know, full, like double down. And he has to be, well, I plan on educating myself a little bit, which is like, okay, that's annoying. Mm -hmm. But I think like this was revealing to me because how many things like this happen and it's just, oh, I write this off to the publicist and, you know, some Ivy League educated gender studies major is writing a chat GPT apology to the LGBTQ community because they don't want to get canceled. But like, Don't say that do too you... fast, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, you... there's a long acronym. Neo's like got to be in his 40s, maybe 50s. He has seven kids. Like, you think he cares or like understands the like, no, you just said, you know, exactly by the way, thought. neither do his fans. His fans no. actually agree with him, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, this idea of the whole radical LGBT stuff, you know, again, one of the, the secrets is they're tiny. How many people actually truly believe that five year olds should be able to transition and to undergo some sort of uh, hormonal or surgical, you know, program. It's out. It, it's outrageous that somehow we're being cornered into apologizing, you know, about this like tiny, like nothing, um, you know, lobby that that no one actually agrees with. And so, you know, kudos to him for bucking his publicists. You know, uh, maybe we need to go after the publicist community more. They're, they're part of the problem there. That's what it made me think too, because like, how, how many of these apologies now, in hindsight, were just you know, strong armed by some publicist. And by the time it's out, you know, the artist didn't want to then come back and of course fire off this. And like Neo maybe, you know, is in a different place than a lot of people because he's kind of made his money. He's kind of done his thing. Like he, he definitely has had a good run. So he's in a unique place to do this. But that was really revealing to me that uh, like you said, Brian, these are tiny, but you know, a members, members of this tiny community probably work in PR. It kind of reminds me how like HR departments have kind of been infiltrated by a lot of like angry liberal women. And so they're the most oppressive and like, I don't know, we have a great HR department. Shout out Kat for real. She's, she's great. Uh, she handles the podcast, but speaking of HR departments, the best riff I've heard recently at HR departments, go listen to Tucker Carlson at the uh, oh, family yeah. leader forum in Iowa. Maybe you can get a clip there. Great riff on HR departments, but I think it applies to publicists as well. I mean, these people have way too much, influence and authority and we give them way too much attention and respect they should be dismissed outright let the let the artists speak for themselves let employees resolve a lot of their problems person to person in the way that we used to instead of having to go through these intermediate people that will filter what we were really thinking tell so the, that tell the know. tucker story because if you know I, I know what he said but do you remember what he said i actually don't remember exactly so, what he said so, so you tell your instincts were good but he said like Basically, he got a formal complaint or something from someone at Fox. Oh. And they, uh, he went to them in the hallway, I think. It was like, hey, you know, if you have an issue, like, I'm really happy to talk about it. Like, I, I don't I don't know exactly what I did, but, like, let's, you know, mano a mano have a conversation. And so Fox sent someone from HR to his office and said, you cannot contact them. Like, you can't go to them in person. And he, like, just looked at him and said, get out of my office. He's like, I, I really try to be nice to people. But HR, like, are some of the most evil, pernicious people I've ever met. It's like, get out of my office. I'm a grown man. You can't come here and tell me I can't talk to another human being in in an office setting. Like, that's unbelievable. And he's just, like, sent her out. Said, never come to my office again, I think was what he said. <laughs> yeah, I, we I, need I, to do a whole segment, by the way, in a future podcast on useless jobs. Again, <laughs> there is a, there, there's a place for HR. We have an HR department. But there is a whole category of jobs in this country. And actually, a bunch of social commentators have talked about this, some of the the, the interesting developments of a, of a modern economy where we have a lot of people that have justified their existence um, oh, yeah. intervening mm -hmm. in ways that we never needed before. Why can't Tucker Carlson go to this employee and work out the differences that they had? It's there's, you know, we, we, we've created so much insulation. We're so we're so soft. We can't we can't actually deal with our problems anymore. We have to go through the bureaucrats in order to to get along. Yeah. And I think the the interesting thing about those useless jobs, which, you know, my husband works at a university, so I'm thinking of the DEI office in addition to <laughs> HR. And, and But it's interesting how the most, it seems like the most useless jobs that, like you said, intervene in normal human processes and conflict resolution, they have the most power at these institutions. Because those are the guys that you get a visit from HR, you get a call from the DEI office because somebody said something and it's an anonymous accusation. And now you have months and months of review to go through just to keep your job. It's it, it's a, a, a typical, and I don't want to get like all 
QAnon or whatever, but it's a typical Marxist <laughs> approach, right? <laughs> that you create positions of power that are actually unnecessary for normally functioning human society. And they end up having all this kind of power. And it's a it's an atmosphere of fear, right? And I think what I loved about the Neo, his little like self-taken video in his car, is this guy I came across as just fearless. And I'm like, oh, heads will roll. So those sort of like stick it to the man, stick it, sticking up for uh, freedom and just being like, look, I don't answer to you. I don't answer to my publicist. I'm going to say what I know is right. Reality smacked me in the face, as you said, Brian. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's so refreshing to, to just see that fearlessness come across. By the way, Erica just diagnosed the problem of the deep state. Hey, the, the exact problem for. you cite of all these useless jobs that operate by a culture of fear and are unaccountable is exactly why mm -hmm. we have this problem in Washington, D.C., where these people who dictate all of the rules of our lives that we don't know who they are, um, there's this you know rule book that we may have access to, but they decide, unaccountable to us, um, and they operate through culture of fear. It's actually one of the secrets, both in corporate America and in, in, in politics, why the left has so much power. But again, another episode. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's interesting. This stuff. is a great I mean, segment. I think, I think that, uh, tr to his credit, Trump was one of the first people to capture, I think, a lot of maybe the, like you put the finger on it right there, Erica and Brian, but maybe people were frustrated but didn't know exactly why. And then Trump, of course, declares war on a lot of these, you know, entrenched bureaucrats of like these people run your lives and they shouldn't. Right. He brought it and, to and national this consciousness power. that this is going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now, like, to his credit, that is a conversation we're having in 2023. People are still just as angry about like these well paid bureaucrats in D.C. And he, he, of course, has a lot of loyalty built in now because he was one of the first people to really like put that on the public consciousness and make it an actual running issue. Like, I'm going to run to slash these agencies. I mean, I think I hear it more now. I think maybe before he's like, maybe we'll regulate it or I'll put different people in charge. But obviously it didn't really work out. So now everyone's saying, I'm running to slash it. Like these, as soon as I get there, it's going to be, you know, problems. Yeah, so. well, quick anecdotal. Uh, when Trump left office, I remember talking to a pretty high ranking person from his White House who told me that the president said, when he got into office, he thought, look, it's going to be, you know, typical American politics. You fight with the Democrats, you try to get something done. The biggest revelation he had after four years was that he had no, um, he did not anticipate well enough that he would spend most of his time fighting his own government, including his own branch of government. Of course, the administrative state is part of often most of the executive branch. These are all agencies that flow from um, con Congress, you know, ceding its authority to to all these bureaucrats. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, you know, Trump Trump has promised if he gets back in, he's going to take pretty dramatic action. And, and that's one of the big reasons why I think uh, he won like 4% of the vote in Washington, D.C. in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> they want to keep their jobs. Yeah. You put a lot of people out of jobs. Well, and just and, to give uh, a, a more near-term preview, next week we're definitely going to be talking about uh, the administrative state's new regulations around the Pregnancy Workers Fairness Act. Anyone here who's an employer listening, anyone oh who's pro-life, anyone who's Catholic, religious, um, this is another act of the deep state. Again, a very few administrative employees talk about useless jobs wielding great power over how we uh, pay for or don't pay for people's abortion and our employees' abortions. So stay tuned for more on useless jobs that change your life next week on Loopcast. little pitch yeah, there. Yeah, it, well, it's that. And I... I, I there's just so much here, of course, but we were, we've been on the pregnancy work, uh, fairness, sorry, so it's PWFA. Pregnancy right? Workers Fairness Act, big mouthful, we've PWFA. We've been on that. Like, we've been covering that for a long time. Yeah. We've been advising on that. We told people this was going to happen and they did nothing. Okay, there's number one. Number two, we had Tommy Tuberville, senator from Alabama, on months ago. And now as of recent, you know, we have uh, Lloyd Austin basically saying he's hurting military readiness. We have President Biden saying he's hurting military readiness. And these are all just administrative nonsense, like trying to fly people around the country to get abortions is somehow necessary for military readiness or or having the government pay for trans surgeries for uh, soldiers. Like these are complete. The What is the purpose of the military? You know, like these these things are not contributing to the aim and purpose of what the military should be. And so, like, we're not it's not like we're fighting foreign foreign adversaries. We're fighting ourselves. Right. And, and Tommy Tuberville is like he gets it. He understands how he can leverage his power here and he's doing something about it. But to criticize him like he's doing something wrong or he's the holdup is outrageous because 
the the administrative state are the ones trying to come up with the progressive policy policies that have never been in place before. Same with the Pregnancy Workers Fairness Act. So like the frustration's real. I feel it. <laughs> you know, you feel it here at Catholic Vote. Like it makes sense. Like these these people need to be stopped. Like something needs to be done about it. Yeah, I mean, the whole Tuberville and his hold on these military appointments is so important. Yesterday, we publicly called out uh, Nikki Haley. Um, she is saying, look, there has to be a better way. And she's essentially criticizing Senator Tuberville for this hold. Why are we not? Why are presidential Republican presidential candidates not calling out the president? No president in U.S. history has demanded that the, that the United States military pay for abortions uh, for its employees. There's actually a case to be made that it's actually illegal on, under our current law. Um, we can't, there's no authorization to pay for abortions in the military. And we have the Hyde Amendment and, and other protections that would prevent it. Um, the focus here should be on the president. The president is the one holding these appointments hostage over funding of abor- taxpayer funding of abortion in our military. We can't pay for, we don't have enough bullets because we're sending everything over to Ukraine. And yet we are, um, you know, hamstringing the, the, the military over, um, you know, abortion funding. And frankly, Nikki Haley, if this is her position, that Tuberville is doing something wrong, should not receive a single vote from a, from a pro-life uh, uh, GOP primary voter. Absolutely. This is totally yeah. disqualifying, yeah. in my opinion. So Josh would be so proud of you right now, Brian, that you were able to slide in criticism of Nikki Haley. I mean, that's Josh's thing, <laughs> Josh has thing, a little Brian. tear in his eye right now. He's like, yeah, that's he's so my guy, proud. Brian. I can see him on vacation right now. <laughs> I was going to do a couple of my favorite Joshisms. Maybe I'll save it for later. But I, I actually thought I should have got a Minnesota Vikings hat just to, <laughs> to wear for the interview to, to honor him in his absence. But I'll stay tuned. I have a little piece of Josh at the Please end. Please do. I think everyone would appreciate Taking a down Josh Nikki Haley is a good yeah. sub for the Vikings hat, though, I have to say. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so we're going to run into the Twilight Zone now. Eric, I see you're up first. What do you got this week? Oh, I'm up first. Well, hey, we've covered the post-pandemic learning loss quite a bit on this show. We've talked about classical education, K-12, test scores, tanking, and who would have predicted. Uh, I loved this story in the Wall Street Journal revealing that the post-pandemic generation of workers are also coming up short. So we're not just talking about test scores. Now we're talking about employers finding shortcomings in employable American youths that run the gamut from general knowledge, including how to make change at a register. I mean, how many of us have been in a store and the person cannot make change and you're like counting it out for them? To soft skills as well, such as working well with others and emotional readiness for adult responsibilities like showing up on time. And the the op-ed was, I guess it was long-form journalism mixed with some opinion. It was really great at anecdotal evidence from employers, managers around the country on how the quality of the students coming out of college to be employed has really just tanked a lot of them pinpointing the decline well before the pandemic, which only sort of exacerbated uh, this. And the reason why this stuck out to me, obviously, this is no surprise to anyone who's been following this. The reason it stuck out uh, in my mind is that it talks about how colleges now, and we're talking like, you know, tier two colleges, good schools, um, the increase in demand for remedial study skills and for remedial basic life skills has just skyrocketed. So now you have students paying inflated college tuition, which is just through the roof, outpaces inflation on all metrics. Um, College students paying to be taught how to do things like talk to human beings, report to a boss, uh, you know, type in the correct numbers into a spreadsheet to track uh, income and output for businesses. Reading, writing, and critical thinking skills are not the same as they were in the past said Mike Altman, a religion professor at University of Alabama. And this really tracks with our experience. Those of you who know, my husband is a professor at a university uh, here in Connecticut. And his most popular, he's he's been here for over 10 years, so we've seen this trajectory in his students. His most popular course that he offers right now is a self-improvement, three-week self-improvement class for which students are paying $4,800 for three college credits to learn things like good sleep habits, grit, using your phone alarms to form personal habits of readiness for life. I mean, the things that he's teaching them, it's just, it's blowing my mind what he's getting paid to do. Well, you you know what this strikes me as? It it, it strikes me as 
parenting. It is. Like all, it is many parenting. of the things that you described are like could should actually parents have an obligation to teach these Absolutely. things. Absolutely. I guess it's just been outsourced either to like public school that's been failing them or to phones or, or whatever. Right. Like I've seen so many iPad kids now. And that also seems negligent too because of all the addictive forces that we kind of brought up earlier, but they're addictive forces drawing you towards things that you know, don't give you skills. Right. And right? I think like, that one of the ways in which the article really missed the boat here was that it concludes with, well, high schools are failing these students. But the kind of skills that my husband's seeing he needs to provide, the kind of skills that these employers are describing as lacking, this is stuff that should be learned in the family and in the community. This should not be, you know, your ninth grade study skills crash course that, I mean, I had to take one but they, you shouldn't be relying on teachers and outsourcing this outside of the home. And I think, you know, this is downstream from the breakdown of the family, um, absentee parenting, and, and just our whole cultural sort of decline. But uh, it was a really good read. Again, Wall Street Journal waking up to the fact that, oh, if students are failing or workers are probably not doing that well either. Um, and dark read. But at the same time, those of you out there who are actually parenting your kids, who have them at the home, who do things like eat dinner together as a family and teach your kids how to resolve sibling disputes around the dinner table, your kids are going to be leagues ahead of the peer group. So kudos to you. Keep up the good work and spread that message, please. Yeah, Brian, I think you you have the record for most kids, right? Like, have you, have you taught them how to set alarms on their phone or, <laughs> you know, give change? Well, I mean, Eric could give some great recommendations, you know, have a meal together in your home. Um, have lots of kids, by the way, because that also creates a community that's not virtual. And, you know, shocker, two years uh, with, you know, working from home in your pajamas has social consequences. You know, this is one of the <laughs> things a lot of us were screaming that when a whole this lockdown madness happened, there are all sorts of other things that are going to come about as a result of this. This is not just a medical question in isolation. And, and lo and behold, now they're, you know, saying, well, you know, we're not experts in anything except the epidemiology. That's the only thing we know. Well, okay, well, at least now we know when the next one comes, that's the only thing that you are opining on and that the rest of us need to sort out a lot of the other goods that are, that you're putting at risk. But uh, yeah, you know, master's degree and what fork to use at a, at a fancy dinner. Um, <laughs> we... we Amazing, Tom. We should be creating a whole new program here. We'll charge half. It'll be twenty four hundred dollars. There you go. Uh, and we'll give you <laughs> ba basic life skills. I think we could teach a good class. I think Brian's my favorite entrepreneur out there, man. He's just I've never seen a guy with more, more ideas. That's genius. <laughs> I mean, I could I could teach that with you easy, Brian. Catholic vote, adulting one hundred and one. <laughs> <laughs> it's referred to as a wellness program. Oh, right. Sorry about that. Yeah. Ah, right. yes, yes, yes. More yes. gentle. Yeah. yeah. I, I, th you know, Brian, I'm a little disappointed. If if you really were in Josh mode, you would have made a joke about me basically being a child and that I need to be taught these things as well. But um, I appreciate it. Ageism your, um, has no home here, you know, Tom. Restraint there, not this yeah, week. I appreciate the restraint. No, Thank Tom, you. you've 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 merged as a uh, adult. You do a lot of adulting now. You have a child yourself. You, it's true. You know, your your beard is <laughs> has grown, hair. and I mean, I mean, better than a mustache, but. The mustache was polarizing for sure. Mm. It had a good run for sure. It was, it was interesting seeing my face on YouTube with a mustache. That was kind of a surreal moment. Um, but we move into my twilight zone. It's not the beard. It's not the mustache. It's not my age. It is U.S. women's soccer. Okay. So you, you knew this was going to come up. Uh, for those wondering, I yes, I am a red-blooded American. Uh, I have ancestors from Croatia, but uh, they settled here. And it's, I love America. And when America is represented at the world stage, I typically like to root for them, uh, regardless of what it is. I mean, if the U.S. is playing in a cricket tournament, you know, fire me up. I, I'm a U.S. cricket fan. But uh, U.S. women's soccer for a lot of people, and I've really had to sit and think about this. Many people were cheering against them actively. And that's kind of a bizarre phenomenon because Americans typically very patriotic. And I found myself rooting against them as well. And I really had to dig into like, why, like, why do I, it's just, they're so off-putting. Um, and I think, you know, a few things come to mind, you know, there's uh, the, their fearless leader, Megan Rapino, um, very publicly anti-American, uh, very just nasty. There's a lot of clips of her, uh, very entitled. It's just, she's a very off-putting woman. So, okay. When the leader's like that, that's tough. 
Uh, and then in the previous World Cup, I found out that, and I remember this, she she knelt in protest uh, during the anthem, representing America on the world stage, uh, and said that she would never sing the anthem again. She would never stand for the anthem again. And so when U.S. soccer said, okay, no, like you need to stand for the anthem when we send you places, she actually led a charge back saying, U.S. soccer is racist and needs to change this. We need to be allowed to protest. I can't stand the fact that you know, you're not all in on Black Lives Matter, whatever it is. Okay. So she's told this year that she had to stand. So her choice this year was to put her hand behind her back and look solemn during the anthem, not sing. A few other players participated in that as well. And I think that was just the first thing that was kind of off putting. And then here's the other thing like, the United States was a heavy favorite, obviously, because it, it corresponds with the freedom of a country to put together a girls' soccer team. Because there's many countries that don't send women's soccer teams because they're not allowed to either not wear something over their head, participate in uh, in um, sports, athletics on the world stage. And America, ironically, has the best team because we have the most freedom. And yet, uh, being heavy favorites, we lose in the round of 16. Uh, that ended our three-peat chance. We lost to Sweden. Okay, so Megan Rapino herself, she lost a very consequential penalty kick and was kind of smiling and laughing uh, during it, which a lot of, rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. When asked in the post game. Uh, you know, what did she take away from this experience specifically at this World Cup? She said, uh, well, you know, an equal pay chance. Uh, didn't say anything, which is, can I get into how un-American oh that is gosh. too? Like when you don't win, you should be mad that you, like it's un-American to lose basically. Americans are big fans of winning, very competitive. And we're talking about equal pay right after a big loss like that. And uh, the Twilight Zone, you know, all of that, part, potentially the Twilight Zone. But I think the other thing was, you know, looking at the other nations, this is kind of a classic example, but like Sweden, you know, th- there were some of their players that were crying, singing their national anthem. They were so proud to be there. Um, all of these women, beautiful, athletic, classy women. And then we look over at the Americans and not all of them. I don't want to throw, it is kind of why it's tough because some of the Americans definitely were patriotic, proud to be there, you know, represented well, but there were so many of them that just look so nasty. Like w- we're not sending good I think examples are role models for even America's women, but just, it's just embarrassing to have that on the stage. So it was kind of a twilight zone, me rooting against America. And, uh, yeah, it, it, I just, when I went into the history, I was just like, it, it makes sense. Why? But Tom's finding his inner Trump. America isn't sending their best uh, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> when it comes to women's soccer. Yeah. No. Cause like we, we should at least be sending people that represent us well, even if they're not you saying winning this should be good yeah, yeah like i don't know like yeah i guess it seems kind of common yeah, sense. they're on the world stage and like women's soccer doesn't get the platform that men's soccer does but around the world i mean soccer known as football everywhere else is the sport to watch so like hundreds of thousands of people are watching these games and seeing our women out there representing us with just this sour puss i hate my country america's terrible it's it's so it's super demoralizing. I also thought Disband the team. you mentioned this time. You said Megan Rapinoe actually made a statement too that she feels that biological men should be able oh, to play that. on the U.S. women's soccer team. And this is from the woman who she this was just last was it in May or something? The U.S. women's soccer team did a tournament against these high school boys in Dallas and they just lost. It was like eleven to zero. They lost every single game against these high school boys. And she's like, oh, yeah. To be fair, Biological it, was men should 15, play. it was against a 15-year-old team, and they lost 5-2. to two. Yeah. But they also played uh, retired soccer players that were in their mm-hmm. 50s, and they lost. That was when they lost like 18 to nothing. Yeah. That was a brutal loss. So basically, loss, but, Megan Rapinoe, um, yeah. if your dreams come true and you get equal pay and biological men take over women's soccer, <laughs> you're just erasing women in sports. So congratulations. You can just fun anecdote go too. Way. I met yep. I, I met Megan R- Rapino in person. What'd yeah, you she, say? I met her outside of a out of a Chipotle in uh, Naples, Florida. Okay, I like Chipotle. And um, she was tall. I was shocked at how tall she was. I mean, very aggressively looking lesbian for sure. Like no, qu- I think she was there with a girlfriend or or something. I'm not sure her relationship status, but um, yeah, we had a girl take a picture with her. I had no desire to take that picture, but um, yeah. Matter outside of a Chipotle. True story. Well, True I story. proudly say I didn't watch a single minute of women's soccer. I'm pretty sure. Didn't she miss a penalty kick that could have won the game? Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. if I saw something on Twitter, I think Trump yeah. tweeted, nice kick, Megan. Because she because <laughs> she missed she missed the kick, I believe, that resulted in the tie oh. that eliminated the US, if I'm not mm. mistaken. So 
Yeah, Indeed. it was. Uh, well, that was round of sixteen against Sweden. She lost a. She missed a kick that would have won it for us, I think. And then because that one didn't win, then it went on and we lost. And yeah, but Trump, man, nice kick. <laughs> Leave it to Trump. All right. My t- uh, Twilight Zone, I have a much shorter version, but I asked you all, so what's the what's the criteria for Twilight Zone? And you said, you know, where you just, you are you feel like you're in the Twilight Zone. Um, well, then I looked it up real quick. Do you know where, where the Twilight Zone is on the Earth? Do you know? I didn't know this until today, by the way. The Twilight Zone is about a thousand feet approximately below the water's surface where the sun doesn't reach. And the interesting thing is there's actually still a little bit of light there because of the uh, bioluminescent um, features of certain of the sea creatures. So I thought there was a pretty good analogy there for the world, especially coming out of Ohio, where everything seems so dark. Uh, We are hopefully uh, the bioluminescent human beings in sometimes a dark world. But that's my intro to my real Twilight Zone, which is... Um, I'm going to take you back to 2005. I know it's supposed to be the last week or so. 2005, I'm in the Washington Hilton. Catholic boat had just started. We're in our first months of operation. Uh, Justice Chief Justice Rehnquist dies. Uh, there's a nomination. Um, uh, John Roberts, actually Sandra Day O'Connor retired. Then Justice Rehnquist dies, so they they swapped out the picks. It's a trivia question there. Um, we just started our organization. You talked about at the beginning of the segment. We decided to go to Washington, D.C. We spent, I think, almost every cent in our bank account at the time. We had like $3,000 in the Catholic Boat account to fly out there to rent a hotel room because we wanted to influence the outcome of this confirmation process. We knew the Supreme Court was everything. And as we since learned, it was everything because later, later that fall, Justice Alito was nominated after Harriet Meyer's debacle, et cetera. But so we're in the Washington Hilton. Uh, We had connecting rooms because there's three of us, uh, the three people that the first employees of Catholic Vote. And we started this thing called the Fidelis Podcasting Network. Fidelis, of course, Latin for faithful. Fidelis is actually the legal name of our nonprofit. And who was the host of that podcast? None other than Joshua Mercer. (laughs) But here's the best part. It was the thing he hated the most. He (laughs) hated it. He said, this whole podcasting thing is going nowhere. You remember in 05, the the iPods were these little dials with the primitive screen. I mean, none of these apps, none of these touch screens. It was, I mean, and he said, this is such a waste of time. I don't know why we're doing this. But I remember he would wake up to record his podcast. And because he needed to create a sound barrier, he built a little stack, like kids build of pillows, you know, like a pillow fort. (laughs) And he would he would have his microphone with this clunky laptop there. And he was so angry that he had to do this podcast, this silly podcast thing that obviously no one was going to listen to. And he would interview people like Judge Bork and Mitch McConnell and others and and um, you know, I maybe I'll have to go look. There, That's there was amazing. no cloud back, cloud we back need the then. So I know. I we need, need the to go tapes. find there. There was no cloud back then, so I don't know where we saved them. We probably have them on some external hard drive, like in the box of files. So I'll make that promise. I'm going to go back. I'm going to try to find some old clips of the the Dallas Podcasting Network. Um, when Josh is back, he'll have to give you That's his incredible. take on it. But you know, Are you who, serious? who so knew you, you talked to we, McConnell? Oh, yeah. We, he interviewed a lot of big people. I mean, keep in mind at the time, this was, you know, in the midst of a confirmation process where, um, you know, we were right there on the Hill. We were working with the Judicial Committee, committee staff, um, anything we could do to get the word out. And of course, we we were pushing that the attacks on Justice Roberts' personal beliefs were a violation of the Constitution's prohibition on a religious test. That was kind of Catholic votes angle in that fight. And I thought we bought it rather valiantly with no money um but no josh was he was a podcaster back when podcasting was not cool and he certainly didn't like it and lo and behold he seems to like it a little bit i think he likes it now i think he really enjoys it well at least i hope he tries to hide it he tries to hide (laughs) it i have a sinking suspicion he likes it for sure yeah um all right brian so this just means we're gonna have to regular bring you on to tell stories about josh absolutely well, I'm I'm a regular listener, so thanks for all you guys are doing, and I look forward to hearing Josh's tales of vacation when he returns. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So that does it for this episode. So uh, one thing I wanted to bring up, I did mention that I might lose my job if we don't get over 300 
um, reviews on Apple Podcasts. And just for proof, I have it. We are at 303? Uh, 305. You all came through. So we survived. Yes, We have the casters. latest one from Je- Jennifer G. I love listening to your weekly show. It is awesome. You guys are great, smart, and funny. Thank you for what you do. Jennifer Gregory Taylor's South Carolina. Great, honest, and fun right there. 305. So if you'd like to contribute to that, it really helps us out. You just can give us a rating, five stars. You can write a review as well. Spotify, I'm looking to get over 100. I think we're about 92. That is the best way you can help the show right now, other than, of course, sharing it with someone. Uh, we're on both YouTube or any place you listen to podcasts, so check us out there as well. And uh, for the sign-off, we do Our Lady Guadalupe, St. Thomas More, St. Fidelis. Pray for us, and we'll see you next Thursday. Bye, guys.